Okay, so tonight we're going to take a little break from Hebrews. Uh, I thought it'd be fun. Uh, we're going to look at a series of contradictions and some arguments, uh, two arguments that uh, uh, typically are made by atheists, and uh, just kind of talk and, you know, kind of see what you guys think, and I'll offer my two cents as well, and we'll take it from there. So the first contradiction uh, is uh, between Exodus 20, verse 8, and Romans 14, verse 5. Exodus 20 says, Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Romans 14, 5 says, One person judges one day to be more important than another. Someone else judges every day to be the same. Let each one be fully convinced in his own mind. Um, and obviously you could quote as well Colossians where it says that the Sabbath... You know, it doesn't really uh, hold to us. So, thoughts on that? Answers to this contradiction. Who's got one? The longer you wait to answer, the less points you get for it. <laughs> just kidding. I'm just kidding. Right. So with that in mind, did you guys all hear most of what Melissa was saying? Not really? Uh, she was basically saying that, you know, every day is holy now to us. And uh, it was about the sum of it, I guess. It was, uh, maybe I'm oversimplifying what you said, but that, that's the basic idea of it. And uh, so how does that, how does that make this not a contradiction? Okay. Okay. All right, grace not rules. Okay, anybody else have a contrasting view or just want to build on what she's saying? <laughs> How is this not a contradiction? So the summary of, of, of Todd's uh, what Todd just said, in case you are having a hard time hearing, I don't know what this. I don't know. Sometimes, sometimes I I can't tell if you guys can hear it or not. Uh, but the basic summary that he was saying is that the context of Romans uh, four, uh, yeah, 14 is more about um, not uh, uh, judging uh, other people in their practices, rather being convinced in your own mind. That's kind of the summary, right? They, okay. Yeah. Well, good comments. Anybody else? Ready to go to the next one? Oh, by the way, in case you guys are wondering, uh, all the contradictions I pulled off from tonight are from an atheist website. So I thought I should mention that. Uh, my little two cents uh, would be uh, actually a quote from Galatians, uh, where Paul says that the law was our guardian until Christ came. Uh, so since Christ has come, we no longer need that guardian. We no, only, no longer need that guide. Uh, so we are now free. So pointing at the uh, pre-Jesus state of state of uh, things <laughs> is going to be a lot different than looking at the post-Jesus state of things. Um, it's not like in the Quran, for instance, where you know it'll just straight up contradict itself and then you say, oh no, it's not a contradiction because the Quran is um, what's it called progressive. It's progressive revelation. So even though the beginning of the Quran says, hey, uh, just let this go, and then the end of the Quran says, no, slaughter them all. No, that's not a contradiction. Well, th there's something different happening here. See, in the Quran, there was no change of covenant. It was just contradictory revelations from Muhammad. But in the Bible, we're not dealing with that. We're dealing with God made a revelation to Moses, and then he completed the revelation in Jesus, and so the state of affairs has changed. Uh, contradiction number two is between Ecclesiastes 1.4 and St. Peter 3.10. Uh, a generation goes and a generation comes, but the earth remains forever. And then in St. Peter 3.10, the heavens will pass away with a loud noise, the elements will burn and be dissolved. Uh, I Obviously giving, uh, giving across the idea that it's not going to continue forever. <laughs> so, thoughts on that? Resolve this contradiction if you dare. I actually gave a little bit of a hint on the quote on the screen. Uh, the atheist website didn't have the beginning of the Ecclesiastes verse, and I threw it in there as a little cheat. <laughs> yes, yeah, so all the quotes that they had were straight from the Bible, yes. Uh, they obviously took out, uh, didn't give the context of the quote, but all the quotes were from the Bible, yes. So, 
Everything on the screen is uh, from the, um, I believe it's the CSB version, if I remember correctly. But on their website, they use the King James Version. Um, and obviously, it's easier to get kind of twist the King James because it's just the way it's worded a little bit older. Um, so I used a more modern translation to, to avoid those kinds of little problems. So I'll go ahead and offer my two cents. And if you guys think of something while I'm going, you just... Do something to get my attention, okay? Uh, first off, Ecclesiastes is called a book of wisdom. So it's not meant to be a historical account. It is meant to be a poetical, wise book. And that's how it's written if you read through the whole thing. Um, it has a lot of uh, things that are said in it that are not necessarily literal. Um, like, for instance, it says, um, Vanity of vanity is all this vanity. <laughs> and that's not necessarily literal, um, because then you would have to say that Christ's coming was vain. So you see what I mean? There's, there's, got a, there's obviously a limit to an exaggerated statement. Uh, but then the second thing is, uh, it, it's, it's kind of saying in that, in that thing, it's more emphasizing the fact that people have a very temporary time. And the earth just keeps spinning while we all keep dying and living and, and going on our way. <laughs> You know, we're born, we live, we die, and it's kind of this, this thing that a generation goes and a gener generation comes. But in the atheist website, they, they cut off that first part. <laughs> they just said, the earth remains forever. Well, it's like, well, <laughs> if you ignore what the verse is actually talking about, it, it sounds worse than it is. But anyways, oh. and then the second quote there in Second Peter, well, before I get there, I'll, I'll say this. Um, the word oftentimes translated as forever in the Old Testament doesn't mean forever like we think forever. We think forever as something that has no ending. But the word forever more, t more usually means something that is ongoing. Okay, so like uh, you could say that the earth uh, exists forever. You could say that, uh, it, it, I can't think of too many things right off the top of my head. Um, Forever, yes, <laughs> yes. What was that, Melissa? Yeah. <laughs> and yes, that's very true. People do still use this word uh, in that way. Um, so yes, absolutely. Whereas Second Peter three ten is talking about a historical reality. It's talking about something that is going to happen. Um, it's not talking in poetical terms. It is saying very literally, <laughs> the earth is going to be burned up. <laughs> yeah, it's going to be the end of that story. Uh, so did anybody have anything to say on that before I move on? Don't want to cut anybody off here. Yes. Yes. So you're saying it, it could apply to the new heavens? Or the new earth, I mean? Okay. So you could, I guess you could pro possibly take it as a, po as a prophetical thing. I see the, is that what you're saying? And in that aspect... Um, I'm not sure if there's grounds for it in Hebrews. In Hebrew, I'm not real sure. But if you are correct, then yeah, that would be uh, that would be a resolution of the contradiction as well. Yeah, in our temporary nature. Yeah, absolutely great, great, great comments, Todd. Todd's m m focusing on the verses that came before it. And wh what a great thing to do. Always, always, always do that. You got it. Uh, the atheists, here's the thing about atheists, okay? They love to jerk verses out of context and say, here's a contradiction, and they're going to throw them at you very, very quickly. The Bible says this, the Bible says this. It's like, have you ever tried talking to Jehovah's Witness about their beliefs? They'll try to blindside you by just rapid fire. If you just stop and say, hold on, one thing at a time. Okay, you brought up this, let's look at that. Well, then all of a sudden things start to get real clear. Uh, if you don't believe me, go to YouTube <laughs> and start an argument with, the, with an atheist. It's very easy to do. <laughs> and, uh, and then just go one by one and answer all their questions. They'll always give a whole paragraph of 15 more things. That's just how it does. So. Anyways, contradiction number three. Yes, Todd, it is all context. Most of it is at least. Uh, Genesis thirty-two thirty says, I, haven't, I have seen God face to face, he said, yet my life has been spared. Then in John 1, 18, it says, no one has ever seen God. I can hear Todd flipping the pages of his Bible. Uh, this one really is a lifesaver if you look at the context. Uh-oh, Melissa's starting to flip the pages of her Bible. She's clued in now. <laughs> Don't ever ask. 
Why not? Okay. <laughs> okay. Doesn't seem like an overly helpful answer, but I mean, I guess she probably had her reasons for it. I don't know. Does it ever tell what God looks like? Well, in a way, and in a way not. Um, hmm. So, Daniel has some things to say. The The book of Daniel has some things to say. Uh, a lot of times, though, he's talked about in more terms of things that we can understand. Like, so, for instance, the Bible will say something like, uh, his arm is not too short. God doesn't actually have an arm. You know, he's not. he doesn't have a human body. The Father, at least. Obviously, the son took on a human body, but the father does not have a human body. So obviously, it's talking in terms of just things that we'll understand. So in that way, not really. But then in other verses, it, it does definitely give us ideas like, you know, uh, a bright light and these kinds of things where um, when he manifests his presence, there's different different descriptions that are made throughout the Bible. Um, start with Daniel and uh, Isaiah and then go to Exodus and... Revelation. That'll start to clue you in a little bit. Um, but definitely worth looking into. Okay, anybody have anything to say to this contradiction? I'm an atheist. <laughs> Convince me. <laughs> I kid. Does anybody want a couple more minutes? Or do you want me to just go ahead? Go ahead. Okay. All right. So uh, there's, a, there's a few things. Um, first off, there's kind of this big uh, issue that is a recurring issue in the Old Testament, and that is the appearance of God. So we have him a few times appearing to people, and then a couple times sounding like he's appearing to people. So uh, in Genesis thirty two thirty, 30, what's happening is Jacob is wrestling with this guy in the dark, and then... When that guy goes, he says, oh, this I, I've seen God face to face. So despite how that translates into English, that doesn't necessarily mean that that was actually physically God. I know it sounds like that in the translation that we read, but it doesn't necessarily mean that in Hebrew thought. Um, next off, sometimes when God appears, it's not actually God. It's the, it's the, it's the um, angel of the Lord. Now, this is someone who is sent on behalf of God who speaks in his authority. So it's actually an angel but he has the mark of God's name on him, so he speaks in his stead. Now, uh, you can kind of see, putting things together, that typically the angel of the Lord is usually Jesus. Not always is it Jesus, but usually it's Jesus. And um, it talks about this in some ways, and when you, when you get into John, you can see that Jesus is kind of hinting back to it. Um, you know, I am my father, you've seen me, you've seen him, and he starts saying these things, and it kind of like, oh, okay, and then you get into like Hebrews, and it says that he's the exact imprint of his character, and you're like, oh, so he has his name in him, so he is, right, okay, and you start to kind of put things together, and you're like, oh, okay, all right, so not every time is the angel of the Lord Jesus, but a lot of times, <laughs> he definitely is, but so you still have sometimes when God shows himself, like, okay, in Exodus, Moses said, let me see your glory. And God says, that's too big for you. You're going to die. So I'm going to cover you as I go past you. And then I'm going to take my hand away from you. It seems like that he's talking about a manifestation of his presence is what he's talking about. So you shouldn't think like some old guy in the sky with a beard running past really fast. You should probably think in terms of um, some kind of, of, of manifested presence of God. I don't know exactly what that looks like, but... For what, whatever it looks like, Moses was unable to look at it face to face. Whatever it was. He could only look at it as it was going away. So that leaves us with a lot of questions, <laughs> and that really doesn't get us any closer to understanding this. Well, in John 1.18, Jesus says, no one has ever seen God, and then he says, I have made him, uh, let's see if I can remember it, I have made him known. Wait, no, uh, somebody read that, because I don't want to misquote this. John 1.18, just read the rest of the verse. Yes. And then in another part, he says, if you have seen God, I mean, sorry, if you have seen me, you have seen God. So he kind of equates himself with God. Okay, this is a kind of an important thing here. And, oh, actually, I wrote it on the, on the PowerPoint. Just go to that first, I'm sorry, it's right there. The one, 
Gee whiz. The one and only Son who is himself God and is at the Father's side, he has revealed him. So it, we, what we can know from Jacob is if that was actually God wrestling with Jacob, then it was Jesus, not the Father. Obviously, Jesus can act in the stead of the Father, and if you've seen the Son, you've seen the Father, they act in, in one accord. So it's not like there's a... There's a um, they don't like argue about stuff like, no, let me go this time. You know, this, that's not, it's not like an old married couple that doesn't get along. It's not like that. Uh, the Trinity has perfect unity. And uh, so uh, there is that. Uh, right. He, j- right. Jesus, the name of Jesus wasn't revealed yet. Right. 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 So, as you can see, that kind of fixes that contradiction. But, however, there is another thing that's worth mentioning, so I will. And you can take it for whatever worth, whatever it's worth. Jacob was um, wrestling with this guy at night. Uh, it's very possible that he didn't see him clearly. I mean, assuming that the moon wasn't out, for instance. Uh, it is possible that he was wrestling with an angel and that... After the angel left, because a- the angel was talking in place of God, he was being sent by God, carrying the authority of God, that he could just as well say, hey, I have seen God and, and live. So uh, that, that is a possibility. It is, that is a thing. Um, so, yeah. Contradiction number four this is between Leviticus and the book of Judges. Now, the book of Judges, I'm not going to read the, the whole thing because it's 40 verses. I'm just going to kind of summarize, Okay. So you are not to sacrifice any of your children in the fire to Molech. Do not profane the name of God. Uh, I am the Lord. So let me just head off right here. I know it says specifically Molech, but that doesn't mean that they could sacrifice their children to other gods. <laughs> when he says don't sacrifice them in the fire to Molech, that's kind of like, and by the way, you don't sacrifice them to others either. So let's not <laughs> get off on that little thing there. Because uh, I actually have heard some people try to justify it with something like that. Well, that wasn't specifically Molech. And it's like, okay, calm down there. <laughs> Obviously, God doesn't want us sacrificing our children. So, uh, now the story in, in Judges. In Judges, there's this guy named Jephthah. And Jephthah is supposed to, uh, he, he's raised, he's, he's, I don't know what the proper term is for it. Um, there's a, a, a bad B word that describes this kind of a person where they, they're of an illegitimate birth. I don't know what the proper term is for it though uh so he was a child who was illegitimate (laughs) so he was kicked out of the house whatever you want to call that and uh he kind of goes off on his own well then they some some rabble starts to kind of join him and so the the, israel starts having these problems and they go back to him they say hey look you should come back and help us and jeff is like didn't you guys just chase me out of town (laughs) like wasn't that just you and uh, and they're like, yeah, 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 we didn't really mean it, though. It's fine, just come back and party with us. So uh, so long story short, he, he starts uh, fighting as, to protect Israel. And it comes down to it, and he makes this vow to God. He says, God, if you will give me victory, whoever is the, whatever is the first thing that comes through that door when I get home, I will sacrifice as a burnt offering to you. And then he wins, and he goes home, and his daughter comes through the door. And he's like, ah, what was me? And the daughter's like, hey, it's all right. Let me just go for a little walk with my friends, and I'll come back. You do your business. Totally cool about it the whole time. It's like, why is she so calm about this? I'd be freaking out. I'd be like, Dad, you're an idiot. I'm getting out of here. <laughs> but I guess, you know, this girl, maybe she was just already made peace with it. And so she's, she does her little thing, and she comes back, and that's what happens, apparently. And so then the, 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 the atheist would say, okay, so God knew what was going to happen. And he let it happen, therefore showing that he was cool with the sacrifice. Now, obviously, I have my own opinions on this, (laughs) but I want to hear your guys' opinions on this. So, uh, if you want to read through Judges uh, 11 for a little bit, you totally can. Uh, Excuse me. (coughs) You totally can. How do you rectify God seeming to condone the child sacrifice by giving victory in Judges 11? whereas he strictly forbids it in Leviticus 11. Yeah, <laughs> right? <laughs> but we don't do that kind of thing anymore, do we? <laughs> Maybe not that bad. <laughs> Anybody want to have a go at this besides Todd? Anybody else I should say? 
I mean, I, I Todd's Todd's like a firecracker, man. He's right on. Pow. <laughs> he didn't leave much room for anybody else. Darla. Okay. So so basically, and this this is this is a legitimate view. Okay, this is, we're actually gonna I'm actually gonna mention it on the screen. This is a legitimate cr- view. And what Darla said was that she thought that Jephthah's daughter was never actually sacrificed, burnt offering style, you know, pew, uh, on the fire and all that. That she was uh, taken and dedicated to God and just was never allowed to marry. So that is actually a legitimate view uh, that people have this. Okay, so I'm not, I'm not condoning or condemning it yet. I'm just throwing it out there. Very. Anybody else? Mm-hmm. Is she never going to marry because she's dead or because she vowed? So who thinks that it, that she that she actually got sacrificed by show of hands? Gracie? Anybody else? Okay, so you think probably? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, who 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 has already come with the, come to the conclusion? No way did this father kill his daughter. Grace, kind of iffy. Darla, anybody else? Okay, so we're kind of evenly split here. <laughs> um, <coughs> so let's 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 kind of break this down because this is this is I'm really enjoying this, guys. You guys are great answers, everybody. I'm really enjoying this. Which, what was he thinking? Yeah, his father. Right. This is hard stuff. I actually don't have a finalized opinion. I still wrestle with this one back and forth. <laughs> okay, so so let's let's go through it. I'll make my my two cents. Uh, first off, Jephthah in, in the in the book of Judges as a whole, the good guys don't always wear the black hat, or I'm sorry, the bad guys don't always wear the black hats. Okay, so what I mean by that is, good guys and bad guys. There's kind of a big gray area in the book of Judges. The good guys do a lot of bad stuff, and the bad guys sometimes do good stuff, and it just you don't really know who's the hero. Like, you get to the story of Samson, that's a mess. <laughs> like, that's a huge mess. I, I can't even, I don't even know where to begin. This, that story does not go well. And, uh, I mean, then you take Gideon, and, uh, wow, that's a whole big thing, too. Like, he's doubting God, and then... Uh, he demands signs from God when he's looking face to face with an angel, and then he gets his victory. And so the people are like, "Oh, be our king!" And he's like, "Oh, no, not me!" But then he names his son, "My father is king." And it's like, "Well, <laughs> what, what's going on here?" <laughs> so, with that being said, you know, yes, uh, uh, Jephthah wasn't holy. He was a judge of Israel. He was not holy. Don't think of him as someone who's dedicated to God. That he's our perfect example. <laughs> Jephthah's not. Not that. Uh, and, and then, so with that being said, he did make a rash vow. That's exactly what I have on the screen. That's exactly what was in Todd's Bible. He made a rash vow. And in fact, throughout the Bible, it's going to constantly tell, tell us, hey, don't make rash vows. That's not a good thing to do. It says it in James. It says it in Matthew. It says it in, um, there's another one that I'm thinking of. I can't remember where it is. Anyways, more of the story being, it repeatedly says not to do this. And it gives us a lot of examples of when people made vows that they shouldn't have and it didn't go well for them. So absolutely made a rash vow. Is it possible that in that making that rash vow that he then turned around and uh, kind of went back on his word and didn't really follow it through? That's possible. It doesn't really say that one way or another, so we're kind of left wondering. Um, <clears throat> uh, and then the next thing is that God is not obligated every time a person makes a vow. Just because somebody makes a rash vow doesn't mean that God has to say, okay, hold up, Israel. I got to make sure you guys lose this battle because this guy over here doesn't know how to shut his mouth. 
You know what I mean? Like that's God. That's not God's obligation. And atheists are always doing this. If God was real, He'd prove Himself by this. If if you're real, God, do this. Oh, see, He didn't do anything. He's not real. It's like, well, God's not obligated to do whatever you demand of Him. Like, oh, if God's real, He'll give me give me a billion dollars. Oh, like, that's, just because you claim it, it doesn't mean that God's you know, has to end. There was a whole Christian movement that got off the base with this, the whole name it and claim it thing, you know. If you just believe it in your heart and claim it out loud, it'll happen to you and pixies and rainbows and stuff. And obviously that was not true. It wasn't something based on the word. It was based on something that was a twisting of the word. So anyways, um, uh, then the third thing is what Darla brought up. Did he actually sacrifice her? I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. And here's, here's the reason why I don't know. Because Jephthah, who we know was a rash guy, says, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to sacrifice it, whatever it is. But there is the possibility in the, in the law, there is a law that says that the firstborn has to be sacrificed to the Lord. But then it says this, for the firstborn of the, of the womb, you can redeem that child, because God doesn't want you to kill your firstborn child. So instead, you could redeem that child by offering a burnt, off- burnt sacrifice in its place. So there is precedent from the law that Jephthah could sacrifice his daughter by dedicating her instead of actually putting her through the fire. It, this, is, this is the issue. Was Jephthah religiously following the law, or was Jephthah just kind of trying to follow what he felt was good in his heart? Um, the law of the, I believe it's in, ooh, I want to say it's in Leviticus. Um, it's the one about, um, you know, I can, oh, I don't have my phone on me. Um, it's where you're firstborn and you have to redeem the firstborn. I don't think that's, you know, it might be in Exodus. No, every time that there was a firstborn, it always had to be, had to be redeemed. So if you had, if you had a new horse or a cow or whatever and had a firstborn child, you had to. It had to be sacrificed but for the sake of a for a, for the sake of a, of a human. Uh, there was animal substitution allowed. Uh, you know, I really wish I could remember off the top of my head where that was. I want to say it's in Exodus Le- or Leviticus. That's that sounds right, but I'm not positive. What's up? Oh, it is Exodus. Thir- Exodus what? Thirteen two. What does it say? You don't have to read the whole thing. So Exodus 13, 2, or 13, it's going to go on from verse 2. And that's that's where it's at. It's talking about how every firstborn has to be consecrated. And that if it is in Numbers. Oh, I was totally wrong on that one. Uh, numbers 8. Oh, boy. I was super wrong on that. I really didn't think that sounded like Numbers, but oh, what do I know? <laughs> uh, and, and so then, uh, but for a human child, you could... Right. Yes, that's exactly right. So the firstborn is always to be consecrated to God. But in the case of a human, it's a little bit different than an animal. <laughs> or at least I'd like to hope so. <laughs> but I do call my kids animals, so... <laughs> so anyways, uh, so there is biblical precedent, hypothetically, but it doesn't say that he did that. So we're really... The most natural reading... Kind of seems like he's talking about actually killing his daughter. So it's one of those hard things. If he actually killed his daughter, this should not be seen as God condoning that or being happy with that. Uh, that shouldn't be like, oh, ha-ha, see? God allowed Jephthah to do it so I can kill my kids too. Like That's, <laughs> that's not what he's saying <laughs> at all. Um, and so that takes us to a very important uh, distinction I want to make in the Old Testament. Not everything is instructive in the Old Testament just because it's descriptive. So this is the difference. The Bible will oftentimes record people saying things even if what they said was wrong. It accurately records what Satan says. But we know that Satan's a liar. (laughs) It accurately records what people did, 
even if what they did wasn't overly right. And uh, so throughout the Bible, you're going to find situations where people are doing things that they probably shouldn't, like, you know, marrying a girl and then turning around and marrying her sister. Not a good idea. <laughs> not a good idea. And then it tells us a story to show why it's not a good idea. Because they don't get along with each other. <laughs> and then you get to another story. Well, maybe it's just si- just siblings. Just make sure your second wife isn't from the family. Well, then you get from first Sam- to first Samuel, and it says, okay, there was this guy who had this wife and this other wife, but this wife was his favorite. Ah, favoritism. And there's actually a law in the Old Testament that says, hey, you can't show favoritism like that to your wife. You have to provide for her just like for her. If you're going to have more than one wife, you're going to provide for her. You're not going to throw her under the bus. You're not going to divorce her, whatever. Oh, she's not pretty anymore, whatever. No. You made the agreement. You're going to provide for her until the day you die, son. And, you know, the law was oftentimes not saying what should happen, but preventing people from abusing other people. It actually does that quite a bit. Uh, And uh, so anyways, so people get more than one wife, and it's like, well, you shouldn't do that. That's a bad idea. Uh, The law allowed for it, but just because it allowed for it doesn't mean that it was right. So anyways... um, Right. Right. And why you probably shouldn't. <laughs> right. <laughs> yep. Absolutely. It can still be instructive. Yes, absolutely. Uh, so, yeah, we can probably do another one. Uh, contradiction number five. Wait, did I do that? Did I do that? Yeah, okay, we're good. Contradiction number five. With man, this is impossible. With God, all things are possible. And then Judges one nineteen, the Lord said was with Judah, but they could not drive out the people who were living in the plain because these people had iron chariots. To be fair, before you guys start racking your brain too hard, uh, let me just preface this with this, okay? Because this this is hard, and you were, you are going to have to rack your brain. Whew, so hard. <laughs> but anyways, uh, before you do that, let me just kind of preface it with this. The King James is very ambiguous. The King James reads it like this. The Lord was with Judah, and he could not uh, uh, drive out the people. So it kind of makes it sound like it's saying that God couldn't drive them out. It's like, what's that going on there? So to be fair, <laughs> the King James is very awkwardly worded there. So any ideas on this contradiction, my friends? Is God all powerful or is He not? Mm-hmm. Yes, yes, yes. Excellent point. Did you, hear, you guys hear what he said? God can do all things. That doesn't mean he's going to do whatever we want. Oh, boy. And we're off with a roll. <laughs> Anybody else? Come on. Dan, go ahead. Let me just real quick make sure I'm... I'm, I'm <laughs> you, you made me laugh there. Uh, just to make sure I'm following with what you're saying. You're saying, okay, so God can do anything, but he's wanting you to put forth the work? Which, you know, you you are really he- hitting the nail on the head with that, judges. It, I'll bring it up in just a minute, but yes, you're, you're really on, you're on the right path. Absolutely. Anything else? Because we're running out of time, I'm going to move us forward. But just real quick, anybody else want to say something? No? 
Okay. Uh, there's a few things. Uh, Judges is a book that has amazing depth that's oftentimes overlooked because we read it simply as a history book. If you slow down and read Judges as it's meant to be read, you understand that, yes, it is a history book. Absolutely. It is accurately recording things that happened historically, yes. But it's doing it for a specific reason, to show what happens to God's people when they don't follow God's laws. You see them at the beginning of the book, gung-ho to conquer the land, and then you see them at the end of the book being just like the Canaanites. You see the slow decay of, of, of Israel. It's a very, very uh, well-thought-out book with how it was structured. I highly encourage you to read through it. Um, and then when you get to the end of the book, go back and read the story in Genesis of Lot uh, when Sodom and Gomorrah is destroyed, and you're going to see how Judges is referencing uh, that story. So anyways, uh, moving on, uh, Israel didn't obey God. So because they didn't obey God, they didn't win. The, uh, Judges actually says a couple times that, that the re- that well, I believe it's in the I think it's in Deuteronomy. It says I'm not going to cast them all out at once because then it's just going to get too much for you, too much land, too much wild animals. And it's not going to be good. So I'm going to drive them out bit by bit. So the idea is that they're supposed to seek God and trust Him bit by bit <laughs> as they move forward. Well, they kind of did that at first a little bit, but then they kind of got tired of it. They're like, yeah, it's, I'm kind of over this. I'd rather just go home and and live. I mean, the Canaanites, those are some pretty girls. Why why do this whole going and conquering? We can just marry them, and it'll be easier and funner. Let's do that. And that's what they do. And it has disastrous consequences, um, as it always is when God's people compromise on a standard. Uh, so and if you read in Judges, it does clarify that, that God's people were not doing it. It's not that, they did, would, it's not that God wasn't going to do it. It's that they didn't obey God. They wanted to do their own thing. And so if you read through Judges, it kind of clarifies that uh, quite quite poignantly, too. Uh, and then also saying it worth mentioning, especially if you have a King James uh, version, when it says he could not drive them out, he's talking about uh, uh, Judah, not, uh, not God. And then so Judah gave up. Uh, so that takes us to an idea that's kind of important. Uh, God is not all-powerful in the sense that we think all-powerful. Let me clarify. God cannot act against his character. He can't do that. He can't do anything, see what I mean? Because if anything is sinning, God can't sin. He can't act against his character. You're not going to see God doing things that is against his character. It's impossible for God to do that. So if your definition of God can do anything means anything moral or immoral, well, then that then God's not all-powerful. Your definition of God being all-powerful has to somehow be there. God is all-powerful to do that which is logical and according to his character. So like, for instance, here's, here's, God can't make 2 plus 2 equal 5. 2 plus 2 equals 4. He's, he can't do um, he can't do things that are intrinsically impossible. That's a great way of saying that. Um, he can't make round square. Those are two different things. You know, you, you see what I mean? God is a god of logic. He's a god of order. He can't just like go down to lunacy and do a bunch of stupid things. That, you know, it's against his 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 character. Like he's the one who made reason. He's the one who made the elements. He's the one who made everything work as it is, he, he, he can't go against his character. So he can't act nonsensically, I guess, is a way of saying that. Um, so yes, God is all-powerful, all powerful, but um, so much as it depends on his character. So uh, two more things that I'm going to blow through because we're pretty much out of time. Um, you hear people saying this all the time, I can be a good person without being a Christian. Well, uh, there's a few things. First off, Christianity, Christianity is not about being good. It's not about being a good person. I, I actually have dealt with numerous drug addicts who did this. I got off of drugs without God, therefore I don't need God. The goal of God isn't to get off drugs or to be a good person or be a good member of society. That's not, that's not the goal of Christianity. And sometimes in our kids' classes we do this kind of stuff, like um, VeggieTales did it in some of theirs too. Uh, and it's not necessarily bad. It's just that it gives out the wrong symbol. It's the idea of this, be a good Christian by being, doing good things. And that's good. It's good to do good things. But being a Christian is about being a good person. It's about why do the right thing. Why be a good person? What is good? And these are a series of, of questions I actually have on the screen. First off, what is good? 
when people, when atheists always say stuff like this, I can be a good person without a Christian, a Christian without being a Christian. What is good? Who, who, who gave you the definition of good? Is it just by what I think is right at the time? Because in that, in that sense, Adolf Hitler could have been classified as good. Uh, where does good come from? Where does the, the idea, the concept of good come from? You can't just say it's inherent in all of us because, well, we all have disagreements about certain moral aspects. For instance, let's bring up the thing about abortions and see how long people fight about that. <laughs> I mean, it's a great example. Uh, why should you be good? With an atheist is left without an answer. Why should an atheist be good? Their life is a poof and then they're gone and they don't have to worry about eternity. There's no divine being out there to scare them or some nonsense. So why should they be good? Why shouldn't they just go out there and live however they want to live? There's, there's, an, there's a problem there that really needs to be answered. And then that leads us to the, to the follow-up question. What moral thing can a Christian do that an atheist can't? Really quick. And without showing the answers, don't show the answers yet. Anybody have any, any idea of what moral thing can, an, can a Christian do that an atheist cannot do? Anybody? If you're familiar with atheists, um, Hutchins presented this argument back in the 90s or something. And uh, it's one of those things that he was so proud of. He, he stumped people. <laughs> Nothing? Okay. I'll just throw it out there then. First off, uh, an atheist, it is impossible for them to love God. This is a moral thing, and it's a moral thing because God says it is. Morality came from God, and God said, love me with all your heart, soul, strength, and mind. So he's obviously there's, there's something moral there. And so if the creator of the universe who, and the creator of moral standards said this is a good thing, chances are that's a moral thing, and uh, that's something that an atheist cannot do. They cannot love God. Um, another thing uh, is God is the standard of right and wrong, not not people. So when you get to questions like what moral thing can a Christian do that an atheist can't, you really have to realize that it, it, it's something that what constitutes a moral thing, well, what God says is moral, and so therefore God's the standard of right and wrong, not us. Um, this is part of the problem that happens with the whole what's your preferred pronoun thing. I don't have a preferred pronoun. It's what is and what isn't. It's, it's, it's not something I get to choose and pick. It's not my preference. It's what is. And uh, so this is one, one thing that happens here. So, if I don't obey God, I am in rebellion and therefore in sin. So an atheist is in sin to God, which is one of the greatest sins possible. So it kind of sounds like you can't be a moral good person if you're in rebellion to God. And I hear people do this all the time. I want to live life my way. I want to be in this sexual relationship that God says no to but I can still be a good Christian. I actually heard this from a guy that was cheating on his wife. Can you believe this? Like, oh, no, I'm a good, I'm a good Christian. I was like, what are you talking about, man? You, <laughs> your wife never knows where you are. <laughs> what are you talking about? Anyways, and, uh, that's a conversation for another day. Anyways, so next week we will get back to Hebrews. I just thought it would be fun to take a little time out. I actually didn't think there was going to be one or two of us here. So thank you guys for choosing this over the fair. That makes you a little bit more spiritual than everybody else. <laughs> just kidding. I'm joking. I'm joking. Just kidding. Just kidding. <laughs> oh, that's funny. Okay. All right. Uh, so Jason, can you close us in prayer?